Anna is an associate professor and head of the Russian Studies program at the Monterey Institute of International Studies, where she teaches courses both in English and in Russian in the Institute's Graduate School of International Policy Studies and its Graduate School of Language and Educational Linguistics. Anna is an expert on contemporary Russian politics and culture, the Russian press, and having grown up in Irkutsk, where some of our students have spent some time studying, she's also an expert on the development of Siberia. She's published widely on all these topics, including a co-edited volume that came out just last year from the United Nations University Press on migration patterns in Northeast Asia. As an expert on Russia, Anna's made a number of guest appearances on national television programs, including uh, several on the News Hour with Jim Lehrer. Uh, but perhaps the most important thing that you should know about Anna is that she's the mother of a mid-kid. Her son will be enrolling here as a Feb uh, in this, uh, later this winter. Anna will be speaking today about the evolution of the post-Soviet identity in search of the Russian soul. Please join me in welcome, welcoming her here to Middlebury today. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Michael. Um, thank you all for coming. The topic is exciting, and I can speak endlessly, but I was just giving 45 minutes, and uh, I will try to focus as much as I can, although when I uh, start uh, teaching the subject to my graduate students, I always say, well, what do you know about yourselves? You know, Mary is a nice girl, is an honest girl, is a student, likes uh, color black, likes to read Tolstoy. What else would you know? You know, so people have very little curiosity about each other these days, and uh, even those people who know each other well. And so what can we demand or require when one deals with a country as remote geographically and politically as Russia. So when teaching uh, you know, at the Monterey Institute, we're trying to stimulate students to unleash their curiosity, first of all, and ask all kinds of questions as if Russia were a person they really wanted to know well and intimately and uh, be able to um, not just uh, understand and analyze, but also to try to predict, uh, which is very difficult in political science now. The topic I chose um, is uh, uh, generated partly by my frustration uh, in the political science uh, field of Russian analysis because, uh, uh, you know, when I read the media um, and when I read the articles uh, about Russia, I always wonder what country is that? Uh, you know, there's so little that um, uh, brings up memories or perceptions of real Russia when I read the um, officially accepted point of view. And, uh, you know, that constantly uh, brings me to um, the urge of uh, trying to understand uh, the, what really happened in the country and whether the country which is claimed to be a new country, at least was claimed to be a new country, where it, whether it can exist without new people. And so that question, whether people who live in Russia now are new and whether it's a new country, uh, is going to be one of the uh, major questions I will try to address during my presentation. Uh, also, you know, I would like to note before I get into the presentation itself that when I say Russians, uh, I don't mean ethnic Russians, I mean uh, citizens of Russia, you know, who could be of very different nationalities. Uh, so the general analysis of uh, uh, Russian political developments is uh, built on the assumption uh, or attempt uh, to analyze uh, uh, the situation from the point of view of uh, uh, you know, historical evaluations of socialism and capitalism. So when we read uh, uh, about what happened, what transpired in Russia in the 90s, the notion is that uh, you know, there was socialism, then there was capitalism, and now we have this reverse situation to the authoritarian regime, uh, you know, which is bad. So the approach is very binary in terms of bad, good, and uh, it has uh, been uh, organized and arranged through the ideological lens. And uh, that's one of the uh, um, approaches which, uh, you know, I, I, I try not to... Uh, perceive as uh, the one that's a working approach to analyze the situation. So the, uh, the assumptions about Soviet socialism as bad and immoral 
uh, you know, the uh, Soviet people who lived in this bad and immoral system before perestroika and then the collapse of the Soviet socialism uh, was uh, predicated on this badness and immorality and the assumptions manifest today in phrases like the Soviet regime and the use of this binary categories such as state and people, oppression, resistance, repression and freedom, truth and lie. So the perception and the text, the discourse usually goes within this uh, you know, binary uh, framework. So another uh, way to analyze uh, the situation goes through texts. You know, basically those particular who are familiar with Russian language, and that's also one of the ways I'm trying to expose my students to understanding of uh, you know, what constitutes uh, more than Russians and the history of Russia is through the language. Because, you know, again, the question is, did people change and how much they changed? When you look at the language of uh, pre-revolutionary Russia, uh, language of Demyan Bedne, uh, you know, in the early Soviet years, then you look at the Stalin's uh, you know, newspapers of Stalin's time, then you go into post-war, then you go into the Thor, uh, and then you go into Brezhnev's uh, uh, stagnation period, and you see very different linguistic discourse. And uh, again, for scholars who obviously have not lived in Russia, who have not experienced life there firsthand, uh, you know, they draw their assumptions on uh, homo sovieticus, so those people who resided and reside in Russia now, based on uh, their linguistic uh, models and linguistic discourse. So that could also skew the picture a little bit because, again, I'm coming back to my first uh, idea is that how little do we know about ourselves even when we are in the uh, you know collegial atmosphere or family atmosphere and so what can we as assume you know we know about a country like Russia so um, let me just move from this uh, you know to the two lenses that uh, you know I uh, highlighted here you know the ideological approach and linguistic approach and uh, you know I would like to quote you uh, uh, you know, something that was written by Frank Ellis in the late 90s, in 1998, as quoted by Alexei Yurchak in his book on the last Soviet generation. Uh, when reason, common sense, and decency are assaulted often enough, then personality is crippled, and human intelligence disintegrates or is warped. The barrier between truth and lies is effectively destroyed. Schooled in such a climate, fearful and deprived of any intellectual initiative, Homo Sovieticus could never be more than a mouthpiece for the party's ideas and slogans, not so much a human being than as a receptacle to be emptied and filled as party policy dictated. So this is, uh, uh, you know, obviously an extreme evaluation, but, uh, you know, this is uh, the assumption that exists very widely, and again, that supports this idea of what was happening until 1991 was bad, you know, what happened after 1991 was good, some mistakes happened, and now uh, the country is going back. Uh, so when, uh, you know, we turn into the culture, though, you know, you know, I assume that many of you have visited the Soviet Union, and I have spoke to many Americans who went there in the 70s and 80s before Gorbachev, and, uh, you know, all of them mentioned how liberating was an experience for them of meeting with Russian intellectuals or Soviet intellectuals, of going uh, and uh, having all these kitchen conversations, uh, you know, visiting theaters together and just having uh, human relations, you know, human discussions that they could never ever, the intensity of uh, the hum human spirit that could, they could never experience in the United States. So again, the issue is how can we reconcile, you know, people, uh, those people who I just mentioned who went to the Soviet Union, uh, you know, who have all this extraordinary positive experience, you know, they are, you know, intellectuals, most of them. And so the question is, uh, why didn't they notice this monster of Homo Sovieticus that is, you know, who is described in the quote that I just cited. So there's obviously, uh, you know, some gap uh, that needs to be filled up. And uh, political science analysis does not fill this up. So it's very interesting to go into uh, cultural anthropology and look at the studies, uh, uh, you know, which identify the lifestyle of uh, Soviet people uh, as characterized by several characteristic features, such, for, such as, for example, identifying svai, you know, people of their own circle, or living vne, outside of the system. So basically being a part of the uh, you know, system in the externally, but still creating the little world of friends and friendships and going into the mountains and going into the theaters and getting, uh, you know, some literature to read, uh, you 
know, the sum is that and sum is that and all those kinds of things. So there was life under the Soviet, uh, you know, under the Soviet regime. And again, the big question is, uh, what changed? Did those people who lived uh, before the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, did they cease to exist? Uh, did they all leave, you know, or they stayed and what happened to them? So again, this question is not, uh, you know, widely analyzed uh, in, in uh, you know, modern research. So I'd like to address this a little bit. So the, um, uh, anthropologists talk about this binary uh, metaphorical division. Okay, when one perceives Homo Sovieticus and the Soviet uh, lifestyle. So you're talking about uh, nothing good could appear in official media, for example. That's one myth, okay? Uh, that uh, some is that and some is that is good. Uh, you know, everything that's being published officially is not good. Uh, another more nuanced division uh, of Soviet culture, which is cited, is, uh, for example, censored and uncensored. Okay, so it certainly, uh, you know, hi highlights the ambivalence of cultural production uh, and uh, still, again, still reduces Soviet reality to this binary division between state and society. But uh, again, those who lived through the period, uh, you know, of the late socialism, and I'm talking about the 70s and 80s, uh, mostly Brezhnev's period, which is called uh, stagnation um, or zastoy, uh, you know, there was, when you speak to writers, and I met several of them during the 90s, and I know, like, for example, name of, the name of Valentin Rasputin may be controversial, but because he's from Irkutsk, obviously, you know, I taught at the university in Irkutsk, uh, so I had the chance to interview him an, an, a number of times, and he was, it's very interesting, I thought, he was telling me that, uh, you know, it's not interesting anymore to write when you can write anything you want. It's not, there is no excitement of pulling the idea through or writing between the lines. And that was uh, told uh, in the beginning of the 90s. But that point of view I saw repeatedly in, um, uh, you know, different media sources and it came up in different interviews. So, uh, you know, several writers mentioned that uh, fact that they could not officially write the way they wanted to write made their prose or their analysis more intense, more fun, uh, more creative. And, uh, uh, you know, that kind of that uh, approach is not, again, is not uh, uh, considered most of the time uh, with the analysis that, that happened. So did, how did the Soviet people live? You know, normal life, what was usually the definition of a normal life, you know, nothing particularly happening, no crisis, uh, comforts, well-being, cordiality, success and order, uh, genuineness, passion and sincerity. This is what the uh, Polls bring to us as the uh, reminiscences of uh, uh, former Soviet people and modern Russian people. So what were the aspirations? The aspirations were to be simply a human being, uh, kind until his or her interests are affected. Uh, you know, uh, researchers mention inf infantilism a little, you know, infantile people uh, considering him or herself just, again, to the point uh, or until the point when his or her interests are affected. Uh, and um, it's very interesting when uh, Livada did his polling and discussions uh, soon after the collapse of the Soviet Union, very few people would identify themselves as Soviet people. I mean, when you say, okay, so like in comparison with Africans or Europeans, do you consider yourself Soviets? They would say, yes, we consider ourselves Soviet. But normally, you know, the perception was like the fish doesn't think of itself as a fish while it's in water. You know, that's how the Soviet man felt himself under the protection of the environment, of the customary ways and uh, rules. And uh, so there was never really uh, uh, much of an informal discussion on what the Soviet person outside of the Soviet system means, okay? So uh, normal environment was considered to be, and again, I'm speaking about uh, those who still lived in the Soviet Union and were polled after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So when they were asked, so what was normal environment for you? They were telling normal environment for us uh, was the environment where we can be passive and onlookers vis-a-vis -vis the system. So this being an onlooker, you know, being a spectator is a very important uh, trend, uh, which we then, I will try to demonstrate how it uh, can be followed through throughout the 90s. Uh, so you live within the system. There are all kinds of circumstances and pretty dramatic circumstances, as uh, we know, in the 90s. But, you know, being a spectator, being an onlooker seems to be a very safe niche. So it, uh, it's nothing new. It stems from, again, from the Soviet time <coughs> type. Uh, 
so Sovietsky Chalavek, the Homo Sovieticus, again, I'm a little concerned about using Homo Sovieticus because it seems to be a very negative stereotype. So when I pronounce it, I do not mean it negatively. It's just, again, the custom, customary uh, term. Uh, Sovietsky Chalavek sounds better to me here, but <laughs> in any case. So it's a social type, uh, set, uh, you know, the type that exists in the set of accepted rules. And uh, so once this person is in that environment, he can be defined as Soviet. Uh, when uh, you know, I started to teach at the Monterey Institute 18 years ago, and I remember soon after that I read a book uh, that was written by um, Weil and Guinness, uh, and uh, uh, you know, one uh, metaphor was very funny. You know, I re I'll never forget. You know, they said you can always recognize a Soviet man or Soviet woman if you go to a supermarket and you see some individual smelling. Uh, can of something, you know, just taking it off the shelf and trying to smell. And again, it, it may be funny, but it's true. You know, it's, <laughs> I can't imagine any other culture, you know, doing that. And I remember again in my childhood, you go into the store and that would be this uh, nauseating odor and you wonder what's there. And it would be a crowd of people shopping. I mean, shopping in this ecstasy of something new appearing to buy. And then you see what uh, they're shopping for and it's a fish and the, uh, fish is labeled as riba ni pervai svežesti, the fish of not the first freshness, okay? So there is a label, there is an official trade, obviously, you know, it's a part of the official uh, context, and people are there, you know, lining up, because, you know, it's spelled out clearly with, uh, you know, black and white, and uh, there is a price, and it's fish, you know, who cares that it's not, that it smells, and so on and so forth. So again, you know, the situations that may seem, you know, complete absurd, and, you know, of course, I could give you a ton of of anecdotes, but you know, uh, you know, within that context, people didn't realize the absurdity of that existence. And again, it was just being within the system, but having that vne, uh, you know, outside uh, perspective, and having also the svoy uh, perception of people of their own circle that was making the existence, uh, you know, quite possible. So, uh, perestroika. Uh, what did we have? We have. Uh, you know, it's, uh, again, you know, when you try to look at it, not from the point of view of a Western political scientist, so we have this mass of people, okay, people who were accustomed to live, as I said, in the several dimensions of be being within the system and ignoring the system. You know, they pretend they pay us, we pretend, they, we, pretend we work, you know, very familiar to everybody. Uh, you know, we have all this spirituality, at the same time there is this totalitarianism, right? So we managed to read Ten Commandments in the moral Codex of these builders of communism. The paradoxes, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, seem to be completely irreconcilable, but still existing. And so there was an idea of the West, as you know, you know, particular intelligentsia in large cities, you know, they all read about it, they all heard, they all read Brodsky a little bit somewhere, they've heard about the, you know, the sum as that was passed. So there was this idea of uh, this West, of the society of freedom, you know, very idealized. You know, many of you probably talked, you know, it's just they talk about it as some kind of a paradise, you know, so this wonderful world of the West. So, you know, when the system started to break, you know, and you know, with glassness and all these historical revelations and, uh, um, you know, the excitement, the novelty of publications in Aganyok, uh, you know, the excitement of waiting for rehabilitation of victims of uh, Stalin's repressions, the excitement of 1989, you know, population was fascinated. You know, for intellectuals, obviously, it was this novelty and the excitement of becoming, in their minds, the part of this, uh, you know, Western enlightenment or part of the European home. Uh, and for the majority of the population, for the mainstream of the population, it was finally an ability to uh, say, you know, how much they despise the bureaucrats, local bureaucrats, who have no honor, who stopped being just, uh, you know, so there were more material, kind of more earthly uh, satisfaction. So all that lasted, but in general it wasn't too bad, you know, in terms of nobody felt like the life was collapsing, so people were still pretty much in their niches. You know, in Siberia there was food rationing starting from 1979, I'm sorry, much before Moscow. Uh, you know, I remember very well, uh, you know, the first uh, attempt of, uh, you know, uh, Rushkov's plan, how it was perceived, but the niches were there, you know, there was a sense of things changing, but nobody realized how drastic those changes will be. So fears started to come only after economic reforms. Uh, and again, I'm, I apologize for the word reform. I shouldn't be calling it reform, but major economic changes occurred. You know, and we're talking about the 
uh, you know, liberation of prices, you know, the inflation that uh, by mid-90s went into 2,600%, and it stopped being fun, it stopped being just talking, you know, it stopped being novelty and recognizes new faces on TV and talking about new ideas. People understood that, uh, you know, for many of them, their, uh, you know, their livelihood was, th was simply threatened. So this is when the society is thrown into that major breakup, uh, and the breakup goes into, uh, you know, smaller, much smaller group of intellectuals, you know, who are finally within the realm of the values and of hopes and the plans that they cherished for so long. And again, the mainstream of people, what do you do? You know, teachers who, in provinces whose salaries are not paid, drivers who are being offered, uh, you know, 30 liters of sunflower oil for a month of hard work. Uh, you know, all these uh, exhibitions, you know, there was a fun <laughs> exhibition in Siberia in mid-90s uh, when, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, it was, it was this very peculiar Russian sense of humor. The exhibition was of the objects that were given to people to replace their salary, you know, the money. And so one of the subjects in that exhibition was a coffin, for example. So what do you feel, you know, if your husband brings a coffin to you as a reward for one month's work, so the barter. So again, it's funny, but it's really not funny. And, uh, <laughs> You know, the 90s brought the fear. And here we go to, uh, you know, again, we can talk about lots of stories, but basically the, um, the motives that go through the discourse uh, and discourse of those who could, uh, not the discourse in the West, here we have democracy in Russia, you know, budding democracy in Russia, finally, we're done with communism, or the uh, discourse of communists or nationalists in early 90s uh, in Russia, which is this uh, brown-colored, you know, extreme Zhirinovsky's discourse. But we're looking at the simple formula. So it was freedom from versus freedom for. Okay, so freedom from happened, happened, you know, so people were free, they could say anything they wanted, they could travel if they had money anywhere they wanted, there were lots of freedoms that came, but freedom for, you know, so the realization of those who were trying to, and there were very few of such people. Who were real, who were trying to, uh, you know, look at what's happening and separate as President Putin says, uh, flies from cutlets, you know, and see where we have really democracy and where do we have demos. You know, and this freedom for was not a satisfactory proposition because the majority of the population could not use freedom for. You know, they turned out to be in the margins. And this is, let me move towards, uh, you know, Yuri Levada's analysis and his data, you know, because I think of him as the, uh, you know, probably the, you know, the sociologist, you know, and I trust the data. And when he analyzes it, he, uh, the, the period of the 90s, he says that 1994 uh, was the year of fear, the period of fear. So all the polls that they did were marked by fear. People were scared. So again, from the uh, in sense of enlightenment, excitement, idea to move somewhere, you know, where, wherever Gorbachev or Yeltsin would show you, then the, you know, air, you know, the balloon get, uh, you know, emptied, and uh, so fear appeared because by 1994, people understood again the mainstream. I'm not talking about Moscow intellectuals. I'm talking about the people in provinces. You know, they were scared. They didn't know what to do. You know, young girls prostituting themselves for hot currency, uh, drugs, uh, drug culture growing. Um, uh, you know, unemployment, you know, money was not worth anything, losing all the savings. Uh, uh, nobody understood by then what democracy really means. You know, civil society was even more vague. You know, what, where are we going? So it's complete uh, uh, loss of sense of direction. So fear was this, uh, you know, in the Soviet, uh, the Russian man by then, and including former Soviet men, it's a scared human being scared by what happened in economics, in power, and in life in general with growth of crime, collapse of values. I mean, how can uh, one bring up children without telling what's good, what's bad? You know, parents were confused. No medications, you know, the doctors in a uh, few cities in 93, 92 published this warnings, please don't sleep uh, in winter, please don't break any bones, we have no medications to treat you. I mean, total collapse, so it wasn't funny, uh, you know, again, so there's just a, a complete fear and the inability to orient themselves, understand where we were going, who is good, who is bad, uh, what's our history, what's our country. So uh, Livada says that uh, 
you know, it seemed very easy, he, he says, uh, you know, in his presentations. You know, they just thought, okay, you remove the obstacles, you tell people you can be free, you tell people, you know, we're becoming a part of Europe, we're friends with the United States, and things will work out themselves. And it didn't work out that way. It didn't in Russia. And uh, so, uh, you know, so 93, of course, we know October 93, the, you know, the parliament situation and support of the United States. You know, of what happened in the parliament, we know the constitution, so many now blame Putin, and I do believe that Putin now has more power than, you know, any Russian Tsar used to have, or Brezhnev, or Stalin, and it's true, but it's not, uh, that it's not Putin who wrote the constitution, it was Yeltsin's constitution uh, after 1993, which was welcomed by the West. We have 94 uh, with this astronomical uh, inflation, we have 95 when uh, the country's uh, uh, industries were given away for, just given away to Svayi again. Uh, you know, we have 96 when elections were uh, made, again, welcomed by the West, you know, with the level of uh, uh, Yeltsin's popularity going from 2%, and of course then when grateful Yeltsin gives media to the oligarchs. And then we have 98, okay? So what kind of, a, again, mainstream human being do we get by 1999? So let's see what Levada says. He says that by 1999, and again, it's shocking for someone, you know, who can only imagine what people lived through, you know, looking at the results of the polls, he says it's amazing because people stayed the same. You know, nobody is asking for anything extraordinary. By 1999, after the crisis of 90 collapse, financial collapse and of 98, the situation stabilized more or less, so people were happy. Well, not happy, but they were content, you know. They didn't ask for much. They asked maybe 50%, maybe double of their salaries, and of course salaries were minuscule. You know, they asked maybe for a slightly larger apartment. You know, but in general, there was no uh, revolutionary spirit. There was no protest, uh, you know, on the scale that, you know, could cause some, you know, system uh, breakup. So, uh, you know, people do not ask for too much. Uh, you know, and it's very interesting is because, you know, the data in 1992 when Livada polled uh, Russians and asked, and then, of course, Western companies were opening up in Russia, you know, in great numbers. And, uh, you know, he asked if uh, people would like to work in Western companies. Uh, most of the respondents said that they would like to work, uh, you know, in Western companies. But when he polled them uh, 12 years later in 2004 and gave the option of foreign, joint, or private, the majority of the population said uh, they wanted to go and uh, work in the Soviet and state companies. And again, why? Because they said, you know, they, uh, you give, they ask you for little, you know, you give them little. So again, I see it as the same trying to protect that uh, you know, that uh, own world, you know, within the system. So basically, you know, again, after this, um, uh, you know, partial involvement, still being onlookers, but there was this excitement, there were positive emotions, there was participation in elections, all those kinds of things. Then there is aloofness and uh, fear and, uh, um, you know, indifference. Uh, and then, uh, you know, by 1999, they say they basically, you know, into this uh, niche of uh, Svayi and Svoy and Vne and, uh, you know, their own idea of how to survive. So the first feature from 1994, that fear goes back into this more Soviet approach to creating of their own world under the circumstances that stay as an onlooker. Uh, the second feature which Livada uh, mentions in several of his presentations is submissiveness. Of course, you know, those of you who study Russian uh, culture and literature and uh, philosophy maybe, hopefully, you know, you know the word dolga I don't know if, if there such word exists in any other languages. It's not just patience and perseverance, but it's dolga, you know, it's a prolonged perseverance, prolonged patience, a very Russian notion. And so, uh, again, he, Livada says, uh, you know, which other country would live through such shock, you know, and still come out with this, you know, onlookers mentality without any attempt to resist actively uh, this, um, you know, the social uh, uh, traumas. Uh, so the stable feature, we see this dolga terpenia, this perseverance as a stable feature. And another one which uh, Livada adds, and uh, you know, I think it's an interesting one, and I'm, I'm still not sure if I uh, translate it correctly, maybe Tom, you would correct, lukavy. You know, people who are smart, you know, this practical smartness, not 
often you know, completely honest and straightforward. But that feature is also something that uh, uh, he mentions uh, prominently. And uh, you know, it's uh, the kind of a lifestyle or attitude, keep things to himself, you know, maybe he or she will not be affected, you know, not, you know, not to show too much initiative. Uh, you know, they polled uh, uh, you know, Russians and asked, have you ever acted against your consciousness? And 15% said, one five said, never. And the rest said, yes, we did. So, uh, you know, 50% said, it's okay not to serve in the army. You know, and the army was a big deal always in the Soviet Union. 50% said, it's okay uh, for young men said not to serve. And the older people, it's okay not to send out children in the army. Again, the perception of serving in the army is different. You know, there's not a volunteer draft as in, United, in, the, in the United States, as you know. 60% uh, of those polled said, that it's okay to ride public transportation without paying for a ticket. 60%. And it's not the Soviet, we're not talking about Homo Sovieticus, it's supposedly new Russian men and women. And the most interesting is the majority of the population said it's okay for us not to pay taxes. But the oligarchs, it's a different story, you know, the oligarchs and the owners of businesses, they definitely must be paying taxes, but it's okay for, uh, for us. So another topic uh, which you know, comes up very often in the analysis and uh, you know, it's, there are different interpretations but they coincide pretty much. So it's a human being, the Russian or the former Soviet uh, citizen and the authority, the power. So the power is divided into two parts and most of you realize it, those who are familiar with polls and of course the power is divided into one major part which is a president and the rest is bureaucrats and the council of ministers and so on and so forth. And so while the president enjoys you know, around 70% popularity, uh, the, uh, you know, Zubkov, I don't have uh, data on Zubkov's uh, government yet because it's still fresh, but you know, the previous Fratkov's government, there were only about 13, 14% of those polled who said that they think the government knows what they're doing. And of course, lots of accusations of corruption. So again, this division, you know, this, uh, it's very interesting. One of the leading Russian intellectuals of a little bit uh, like of a scandalous kind of a direction was interviewed. Uh, uh, when he turned 70, I believe, and he said, what do you expect? Russia is a Byzantium power with the tradition of, uh, you know, the unquestionable authority of the president, and the only thing that we need to do is we need to educate the population how to behave in the public restroom. So that's how you build civil society, you know, and the rest don't question it, but, uh, you know, what you really need to do, and then it will be all fine in Russia. Just teach them how to act or behave in public restrooms. I, I just said it and I realized there may be a different um, connotation with American public restrooms, but that's not what Russians, <laughs> that's, not, uh, that's not what that uh, person who was interviewed uh, meant. Konchilovsky, Andron Konchilovsky, he just had his uh, anniversary and that was the interview. So, and uh, let me just, again, uh, you know, the feature of the spectators, Russian people as a spectators. So, again, uh, the last 20 years, throughout the polls, better to live quietly, to just observe rather than to participate. Uh, started with 89, as I said, the first People's Deputies <coughs> Congress. And, uh, you know, this sense, sense of participation collapsed after mid-90s. And, uh, you know, what, what's one thing that's very interesting, you know, the, some polls show, and Levada did that, uh, and it corresponds with my conclusion here with this part, is, you know, why do, people, why do people feel passive? Because there is no sense of direction. You know, they don't see the goal. Where are they really going? You know, outside of their family circle and their own personal well-being, there is no sense of where the country is moving. Another parallel feature, and that's what Levada's polls show, is that during really breaking points of the 90s, you know, the most traumatic years, you know, say 96 and 98, there was a peak of interest to old Soviet movies, you know, to the movies of the 50s and 60s, you know, to that classical black and white cinematography. And it's very interesting, I think, you know, because it shows that people really are trying to find something in those old movies, you know, those, uh, you know, I guess, sensations, uh, um, notions uh, which are lost in their uh, regular lives. And, uh, uh, you know, it's also very interesting. I did for several years very extensive research in Japan and Mongolia. I studied Russians. You know, the book that uh, uh, Will mentioned is a result of the 
uh, project that uh, my colleague uh, Professor Akaha and I uh, had for several years. And the impetus for this project was precisely trying to understand uh, you know, who are Russians, modern Russians in the context of the other. And so the Japanese seem to be that perfect other, you know, which is, seems to be a very different civilizational platform. And I thought that, you know, if uh, we go to Japan and interview extensively, and I think we did interview every Russian who, who lives in Japan, you know, very in-depth interviews. And uh, the, then we did the same in Mongolia. You know, some fascinating things, uh, you know, come on the surface. What happens is, particularly Russians in Mongolia, Russians who never lived in the Soviet Union, they were complaining about exactly the same things that Russians who lived in Russia. I mean, they, you know, it was fascinating stories to hear, you know, about people who, again, they visited the Soviet uh, Russia, Moscow, say, visited their relatives in mid-70s, and they said, oh, it was very difficult for us because, you know, these big buildings and, you know, people are coming from provincial Mongolia, okay, but brought up in Russian culture, in Russian context. But then they said, well, once we were entering families and friends, you know, we felt comfortable, we felt wonderful, you know, it was our environment. So it was, you know, complete, you know, they could see the transfer of values, the transfer of the dynamics of communication, so they felt comfortable. Yet the same people said when they tried to go back in the 90s, mid-90s, they could not stand it. They absolutely said it was a different, uh, such a different uh, atmosphere that they said we would never go back because it was a different country. Okay, so and again, so when they were there in these very difficult times, it seemed like they were different people. But when you look at the data, at the polling, you know, you understand that you know people st still stayed the same. But what those Russians who were coming from Mongolia could not stand. They could not stand uh, the pressure, you know, the individualism, you know, that they perceived, uh, uh, you know, in communication with relatives who seemed different in the 70s. So the last stage, you know, the big concern, of course, for the, you know, the future of Russia are people who were born after the collapse of the Soviet Union or right before the collapse. You know, because when you see, you know, when you look at previous generations, you see that each generation had some in, inaugural um, event you know, around which they could unite. You know, there was this common discourse, you know, that was uh, breeding or developing values. So the generation that was built with the inaugural event as a collapse of the Soviet Union is a very different generation. And it is not studied enough for us to be able to predict how the values and the behavior and the aspirations of the new generation will uh, impact uh, the future of Russia. Uh, you know, obviously, so those kids who were born in the late 80s, early 90s, you know, that, that it, you know they were born when the system was, uh, you know, the system of values collapsed. And you would say, so it's good, you know, communism collapsed. But uh, the vacuum was there because there was no religion, you know. I mean, where else would uh, values in such a transitional uh, stage uh, of uh, the society's development come from? So the families were in disarray. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, in a couple of years uh, straight, uh, I remember in Irkutsk at least, the history exams were canceled. High school, you know, graduation exams, history exams were canceled because uh, teachers just simply didn't know which history to teach. Uh, you know, the people didn't know what uh, democracy really, you know, what, what the generation of the 20s, what do they know about democracy again or civil society? Because, you know, being developed uh, in this uh, confusion and the atmosphere of confusion. So for many of them, they, uh, you know, it's very interesting, the studies of the history textbooks and the perceptions of those young kids of their own history. So history begins like for us, those who grew up, who were the last Soviet generation, history began in 1917. Here history begins in, uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So the memory of war, you know, it's like it's, they could talk about the 18th century, I mean, World War II, you know, it's a very remote uh, memory. So. Uh, what could serve uh, as a platform, you know, for the country, you know, so it's easy to build a state, well, easier to build a state, but how you enforce values in a corrupt system, in a system that is just recovering from major economic shocks. So this generation, the new generation, should be certainly this, you know, very important uh, object, uh, you know, to study. And, uh, uh, you know, there are two points that I'd like to make, make here, you know, so what's happening, and I don't know how much time do I have, Will, much more time, do I have five minutes? So what we see, and I'll be pl pleased to expand here if you have questions, but there are two things, two tendencies that are coming, um, you know, and appearing on the surface with more, uh, 
uh, intensity, the uh, revival of uh, victory, of notion of victory of World War II. You know, that seems to be what the government has chosen to become this formative uh, revived myth. You know, and I'll give you some data which uh, confirms that. And of course, revival of uh, the Russian Orthodox Church. You know, those are two tendencies which are very obvious. And again, we can uh, look at it and we can be cynical or skeptical or, you know, whatever attitude we choose. But again, you know, if you imagine the country without a clear sense of history, without a clear sense of uh, uh, values, without a clear sense of future, you know, it's not a good country to be in. And there are two ways to interpret it, and there is a much more extreme way. People who say that Russia in uh, uh, the late 90s, when it was on the uh, edge of collapse, you know, was like a woman who was robbed, raped, deceived, drugged, and thrown out, out into the streets when everybody who is uh, uh, healthy and uh, sober is telling her what to do. So that was a more extreme interpretation of what happened to Russia. And the more mild interpretation was that Russia is the Putnik, you know, the traveler who traveled and traveled and then got lost and lost a sense of direction. But the, I guess the truth is somewhere in between. And the answer will be very much in the fate and the destiny and the uh, uh, you know, in the way how this new generation will uh, will be molded. But let me just give you some data that would illustrate that this uh, two tendencies of this revival of uh, um, you know, and strengthening of the notion of the victory, and because that's linked to Stalin, and that's linked to the idea of leadership. And uh, you know, you read recently there was a number of articles in Russian Orthodox Church, so I don't need to uh, to t tell you more probably. But uh, you know, in 1996, when Russians were polled and they asked, uh, "What co what uh, uh, are you most proud of in Russian history?" In 1996, 44% of them said uh, victory in World War. Two. In 2003, 87%. So it's a major, major uh, change, as you can see. Uh, so now, uh, when people are asking what determined the destiny of the country in the 20th century, 78% of those polled say victory in World War II. So again, you know, it's a very large, uh, uh, large group of people. But what is also very interesting, they say that there is nothing that we can be proud of. So that victory is the only event and the major event we Russians can be proud of. And again, uh, what, uh, you know, I mean, it's just a fact, but place that fact into the context of what was happening in 2005. You remember the rhetoric of the Baltic countries, you remember the visit of uh, George W. Bush, uh, you know, you know, you know what, so this attempt to reinterpret, uh, uh, you know, the victory, you know, the notion of victory. So if uh, these two interpretations will, con you know, continue to exist, you know, I'm afraid that there will be some breakup, you know, along those lines, because obviously, uh, you know, judging by this data, uh, you know, Russians are not going to forgive 26 or 28 million people who killed, who were killed during the war. And if uh, the interpretation in the West and in the Baltics in particular, which is the most offensive, of course, and it just happened recently, you know, in May in Estonia and all the SS uh, marching along the streets of the countries which are part of the European Union. I mean, those kinds of things, you know, if that kind of revision of history happens, you know, I can see that there will be some major conflicts. So so then, uh, so from this memory of World War II, you know, what is very interesting is the memory of Stalin's repressions. And again, why I mention Stalin here? Because Stalin is seen, of course, as the leader of the country, you know, which won uh, the war. So listen to this. And during the last 12 years, and that's the poll of uh, 2006, uh, it, 12 years ago, the uh, memory of Stalin's repressions as, you know, a horrific event um, in perception of it was 29%. And now, 12 years later, it's less than 1%. So think about it. The, uh, you know, this rise of the myth, well, myth and the reality of the victory. And on the other hand, the diminishing of the repressions that, were just, that just happened right before World War II, less than 1%. And then uh, listen to this, positive evaluations of role of Stalin in 1998, in, in Russian Soviet history, so in 1998, only 19% of those polled thought that, this is, that Stalin contributed positively. And yes, now 53%. 53%. So um, why is it important? Again, because the same, you know, we're talking about the new generation. And I'll finish just with one statistics, and this is not Livada, this is Zaslavskaya, but, uh, you know, 
scary, scary data. You know, I mean, this, this Zaslavskaya's division of Russian society into three layers, the tiniest one, two percent of the elite, not just the party elite, but the bureaucrats, as she says, people who live in their own world. And that reminds you very much the advanced socialist period, the Brezhnev's time, when the Brezhnev's elite lived in communism, as we always joked. So a very strong, significant parallel. Then Daslavska gives the number of 40 to 45 percent of people who adjusted, who are going to define. Most of them are young people who have the taste of entrepreneurship. They'll survive. They will never go back. But the rest of the population, she gives up to 50 to 60 percent, people who will never adjust and never adjusted. And those are mostly people who live in provinces, countryside, you know, uh, families with lots of small children, and so on and so forth. So. In speaking about this last generation, and I'm finishing, 27% of children now, according to Zaslavsky, that's 2005, are born outside of marriage. But again, it happens in Sweden. We know in Scandinavian countries it's a normal thing. But what is interesting here is that uh, this number grew twofold in 10 years. And Russian culture is very different in terms of out of uh, wedlock children. You know, it's a very different perception. But what's even more scary, I think, is that 15% of those children have fathers who would not admit that those children are their children. And this is where, uh, you know, it's it's uh, scary. And the number that she gives of uh, homeless children, children who live in the street, is from two to four million. That's Zaslavskaya's numbers in 2005, two to four million. And she says that she talked to specialists and they said, if a child lives in the street for more than four months, he cannot be adapted to a normal life. So this is this uh, last generation. And uh, you know, I'll be happy to take your questions. I'm sorry if I took longer time. Again, it's quite sporadic because you want to touch upon this uh, number of uh, uh, points and data, but um, you know, I'll be happy to take any question uh, related to it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Remember the Putin mm -hmm. history team mm -hmm. right. told mm -hmm. him that you should write better textbooks. All right. so how much is this direct propaganda coming back, sort of replacing communism with something else? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or, and how much of this is coming sort of from the bottom up mm -hmm. in terms of, as you mentioned, the kind of sense of emptiness? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you, know, you need something to believe in, so right. it's the grassroots young people. Right. Well, I think it's both. Right. It's, and you're quite right by pointing out to this both tendencies because it's definitely both. And I mean, a country cannot exist. I mean, just think of Americans without patriotism. You know, it just happened differently. There is a, what I call malignant nationalism and benign nationalism. In Russia, it's a particularly dangerous and sensitive topic because of all this, uh, you know, multitude of nationalities who comprise the Russian nation. But I think both, you know, when you look at the horrific scenes from, uh, say, St. Petersburg, uh, those uh, Spalne Rayone, you know, those uh, areas where, uh, you know, children are cynical and and cruel, and uh, they just hate anything that's not white. Uh, and it doesn't come from school textbooks. It just comes from the despair of their everyday life. And the way they channel that despair is in violence, in offensive slogans, and uh, uh, in punishing and persecuting anything that's not like them. You know. On the other hand, uh, of course, you know there are people in the Kremlin who are paid uh, salaries for you know, developing or assisting the development of national ideas. You know, that's what they do. They build the state. And, uh, you know, they're trying, like, uh, you know, you pointed out, like Putin to, you know, scold teachers, you know, for some ridiculous interpretations of history. So there is no coordination. The issue is that there is no coordination, uh, you know, between the school teachers and the government and those sporadic meetings between the leadership. And the reality which people are facing, particularly in provinces, are very, very different. So until it will be reconciled somehow and until a human being will become the goal of the state politics, a human being, well-being, not building the civil society, not building democracy, the notions that are very separate, very away from uh, you know, everyday reality. So when you see the polls, people are concerned about the most important for the people is free medical care, free education, you know, all that set of socialist values, uh, you know, again, which turn into a myth, myth for them. 
So nobody is going into extremes in their evaluations, but the teenagers who grow up, as I said, in that vacuum uh, with uh, drunken parents or drug-addicted parents, you know, that's, uh, that's the outcome. Or depressing, or what? <laughs> kind of along the, 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 same, uh, the same lines. What's, what's your take on this uh, pro-Putin youth group, Nashi? Is this something that's totally being orchestrated from the top down by the Kremlin, or is, is it really tapping into something real at the grassroots? Well, I would say stimulated. Kremlin? Stimulated. Well, I wouldn't say it's orchestrated, but I would say stimulated. And again, uh, uh, you know, a country cannot exist without any respect, particularly a country with the Russian tradition. Uh, you know, they cannot exist without respecting anybody, you know, in the state. Again, just imagine there is no God. You know, imagine the history is turned into trash. And imagine that the state and the state uh, agents are despised. So, and people don't read. So what to do, right? So uh, there are young people who like Putin, you know, who happen to be not overly intellectual, maybe, you know, but they like the head of the state. And so there's no Komsomol, there's no pioneer organization, so they do uh, start this Nashi. And of course, it's welcomed by, uh, you know, by the structures uh, in the state. And I mean, it's extreme and it looks ridiculous to us here, but it's a pendulum. You know, this, uh, the pendulum swings from, uh, you know, Yeltsin as this uh, clown, basically, the way he was perceived, and now to the leader who is not at all popular in the West, but he happens to be popular there, and that's the hero that uh, young Russians choose to have, whether we like it or not, but it happens, and I think it's better probably than not to have any father figure or any, anybody they respect or admire. Yes. How much of a role does uh, the emergence of religion have mm -hmm. in the Mm -hmm. Well, I believe, again, it's interesting, before this lecture I called a number of people who, you know, I have a friend who has a PhD in sociology, but she's a nun at the same time, so very interesting. So she works with uh, priests a lot and uh, with Russian Orthodox priests, and I called several analysts and I asked them the same question. And so what she told me is that there is no data, because I was trying to probe you for some data to give you some numbers. She said, we in the church do not have the data, but, you know, certainly the data exists which is collected by you know, the sociologist or some data, which she is not prepared to admit as the reliable data. That's why I'm not giving you that percentage. Uh, you know, there is an obvious growth of uh, you know, emergence of the Institute of the Church as an existing, very visible institution. You see that, you know, in the state channel, we have all these beautiful Russian Orthodox ceremonies. We have the bureaucrats who don't know how to cross themselves, you know. We have all kinds of things that may be, a, you know, paradox on the one hand. On another hand, this uh, attempt to create this magnet, you know, attempt to create the magnet of beauty, of beautiful music, of this golden embroidered uh, and uh, scented uh, ceremonies and rituals. Again, a country cannot live without rituals. You know, we have the same, you know, we have revival of synagogues, you know, we have revival of Russian Orthodox Church. Of course, the scale is different, but, uh, you know, a country cannot exist without that, uh, that vacuum. So uh, it's there. I can't give you the numbers just because I had this conversation with someone who is very intimately involved with that work. But, uh, you know, you saw a New York Times article recently, you know, about how they're trying to introduce it as a part of the curriculum and by choice, hopefully. But it's very much there, and uh, you know, it's not a lifestyle. You know, religion, in order to become a force in the country, has to become a lifestyle, not just attendance of rituals. And uh, you know, in the 90s, it was very interesting to see the statistics of uh, giving. You know, how the charity, you know, the giving, uh, the tradition of giving was born. And most giving by new Russian, the nouveau riche, was to the church. And of course, it was not because they all of a sudden became very religious or, you know, people in faith. It's because they thought, well, I rebuild this church and my business will be developed. So there is a lot of pragmatism. But again, we don't know. You know, those uh, teenagers in uh, black boots and uh, skinheads, you know, they will not go to church. But so we'll see. Maybe it will capture the population that would uh, develop spirituality in, in any case. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think uh, Russian people outside of intellectual democracy I really care about Putin uh, coming down on, on the freedom of media, of the press, of TV, 
They do not. I can say it's not what I think. This is what the data shows. This is the last, uh, you know, it's even at the very bottom of what they care about. Absolutely not. That's why, you know, the, you know, when I began my presentation, I said that everybody thought you give people freedom, you know, you give people an opportunity to travel, to say what you want, to publish, and the life will be good and wonderful. And it did not happen. Absolutely did not happen. In fact, you know, it, uh, you know, the quality of life decreased for most of them. So, no, people did not care. And this is the argument that, uh, you know, Levada is making, that people really stayed the same. There is no new or post-Soviet post uh, Homo Sovieticus. Mm -hmm. Related to this, the, the question that I think troubles a lot of us, and, and the question I ask my, my Russian friends and students, um, it looks like the country is moving to the right. I mean, we don't, mm -hmm. Mm -mm. economics. Mm -mm. So, and when you ask even, you know, these young Russians who are patriotic, they like Putin, but they also like traveling, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they like the internet, mm -hmm. they don't want to be young communists. No, no. We were. no. Uh, so the question, I guess it's, it's a difficult question, but right. are we looking at some sort of an authoritarian system with a kind of state capitalism? Mm -hmm. What is it going to be 10 years from now? Well, see, we, in this question, you can see how we are shifting back towards those, uh, the lens that I just mentioned in the beginning. So we cannot just look at the country. We have to have right and left and capitalism and democracy and all those kinds of things. Right. But, you know, it's, issue, it's also an issue west or east or south, or now we know north because the flag is being planted, right? So, uh, and, you know, what, uh, you know, Putin is being very pragmatic, as you say, and he's being criticized for that because they say he's trying to, just be everywhere, and it's not uh, perceived well in the West, at least. But again, it's, with Russia, you know, it's very difficult to predict anything. But what I think is being, what is happening, you know, they are trying to attain some stability. Okay, so before they bring it to a mark of right or, right or left, you know, I, I don't believe there will be a return to communism. Nobody wants to go back to communism. There is this partial pulling you know, over the values, as I just mentioned, you know, from the communist period or socialist period. So that will be there. But, uh, you know, there is really no sense of direction. I mean, everybody feels that. And they can, cannot be. I mean, again, the country just is uh, leaving this period of major global uh, cataclysms. And, uh, you know, it's impossible for them to sit and decide, are we going to pursue a nationalist state or are we going to pursue something else? There is simply no sense of direction. You know, there's a sovereign democracy, right? There was one uh, notion. So uh, there, is, there will be a lot of, uh, I think, questioning of the direction. But right now, Putin's, uh, what seems to be, you know, who knows what is in Putin's mind, but the goal is really to get some stability and hopefully try to address corruption issues, you know, and that's the choice of Zubkov, I think, is not uh, just by chance here. And then uh, try to see, you know, how to address human, uh, you know, human factor in, in Russian politics. This is what I'm hoping for, at oh, least. Yeah. But uh, again, see, again, majority of the people support the uh, just, you know, they're not talking about deprivatization, but they're talking about, um, uh, you know, there's no, like, 70% of the people do not say, you know, let's return all the capitals that oligarchs, uh, you know, gained illegally. But they're saying, you know, let's make it more socialist oriented, you know, at least invest into your own economics and at least use the money to give to the poor. So in, in my opinion, this is the direction it will take. And if, uh, you know, nobody wants to repeat Khodorkovsky's destiny, but, uh, you know, I believe between if Putin becomes prime minister and uh, we don't know who will be the president, but someone like Zubkov, you know, such things could be possible, although the capital flight is uh, staggering and, of course, corruption is still very much there. Mm -hmm. such a bleak picture. Oh, I know that. Mm -hmm. So what is the magic and why do people study Russian and want to be there and want to go back? 
Tom, I'm very grateful for this question. Thank you very much. I mean, it's still a wonderful people. I mean, just think of the people who lived through all of that, you know, through all that and stayed human and stayed interested in literature. And, you know, one of the most magnificent things now, I mean, just again, imagine something like this. After the 90s, the way they were, you know, Echa Moskvi now has this weekly uh, poll, you know, and they give, for example, uh, like a war and peace, and they say, who would you vote for from war and peace as the president of Russia? I mean, think of something Something like that from Steinbeck in the United States. And people call in, you know, and Balkonsky would be the president, or Chichikov would be the president, or Tatiana Larina would be the president. I mean, and it's extraordinary, and it gives you goosebumps, you know, because this is very much alive. And, you know, when people were asking me, so how, I mean, you all claim to be spiritual, and Russians are spiritual people, they're wonderful people, you know, it's a great joy and pleasure, and uh, always a learning experience to be around educated Russians, but even not, you know, people who follow com Russian common sense are also great fun to be with. But, uh, you know, I always say, of course, it was an atheistic country, but there was a great Russian literature. Nobody took it away from us. We did live with uh, Anegin and with, uh, you know, war and peace and uh, all the extraordinary world culture, because for us, those were the bridges to become a part of the world and the intensity with which we used those bridges and not became cynical, you know, and not became abusive of the ideals. You know, this is what makes us uh, what we are. And, you know, I do believe in the future of Russia. I know it's bleak, the statistics is bleak, but, I mean, who could have predicted that Russia would win the war? You know, let's go back to the myth of war, victory of war. You know, when Hitler attacked, after the officers were decimated, after uh, all the planes were destroyed, who would have predicted? Who would have predicted that people lived through the siege of Leningrad? Nobody would, but they did, you know, and so, you know, what's painful to me is to watch how ideologues here in the United States are pushing Russia away and are pushing it where, you know, it is such a natural partner for the United States. There was so much trust given to the United States with the, you know, in 91, in 89 by Gorbachev, you know, things that were never recorded in treaties, but it was based on trust and really, really faith that we can become, Russians can become a part of uh, uh, the world, you know, in the full right, not someone to look at and consider to be defeated in Cold War. But that didn't happen. And so I believe that precisely because of that sense of betrayal and sense of being left alone, left, left without help, you know, without assistance when politics is politics, economics is economics. You know, that's when the society was let down. And the picture is bleak. It is normal for people who lived through 2,600% inflation, people who lost values, people who lost uh, history, people who lost their savings. I mean, imagine that. Of course it's bleak, but, uh, you know, they still read and they're still excited about traveling and they're very good entrepreneurs. I mean, look at all these Komsomols. Who are these best entrepreneurs now? Those who were in the Komsomol, you know, because they use that, all those mechanisms, you know, of adjusting. So, I mean, I am optimistic about Russia. I just don't want any time to be wasted in uh, kind of in uh, uh, drowning in ideological analysis, you know, and supporting, you know, what the new Europe, the slogans of the new Europe and pushing Russia away from, uh, from the United States. Working together, engaging Russians would be good for both parties and the world uh, as a whole. Yes, please. Uh, uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Well, it definitely had an impact, and of course, 96 elections, you know, that showed, uh, uh, you know, how the oligarchs had to pull together because Yeltsin's popularity was, as, as I mentioned, you know, very low, and that was in part because of war in Chechnya. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, one of the interpretations of Putin's ascent now, you know, was because 1999, and he, you know, accepted the hardline position, and that's why he was popular among among Russians, but, um, you know, it's in the shadows now. I mean, I'm sure that you're watching it, and it's certainly not. It's in very, uh, f you know, low percents of people who are still concerned about the war in Chechnya, you know, because the materials mostly that are published are positive, you know, and there is a concern of Islamization of Chechnya, you know, that's a different story because nobody knows where Kadyrov would go, you know, I mean, from moderate uh, introduction of Islam, it could go into extreme very easily, and then nobody, you know, Putin, nobody will have control, but you know, the fact that, uh, you know, it's not, uh, you know, knock on wood, you know, there hasn't been explosions on those things into the Russian face, it allows the official media to push it, uh, you know, aside a little bit and let people forget 
Uh, so that's that's what's happening. And of course, we had the figures like uh, you know Anna Politkovska, of course, uh, you know you know journalists who kept uh, trying to write about the issue and raise the issue. But uh, you know everybody knows that it's a major irritant for Putin, and uh, so journalists are afraid uh, you know to to do that. But the general attitude is that situation is stabilizing, but there is a concern of Islamization, and there is a concern of this prolongation of the situation, possibly. Not the war, full-scale war, but the danger that's stemming from the Caucasus and situation in Dagestan. You know, events in Dagestan show that it's very far from being resolved, so it can, you know, it can explode again, perhaps not in Chechnya, but in Dagestan. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It seems like uh, well, we discussed the uh, glorification of uh, World War II victory, mm-hmm. which is in keeping with the, the Soviet politics. But at the same time, uh, the topics of uh, uh, the Stalin's repression, and Stalin's repression, and, mm-hmm. Stalin's repression and, uh, mm-hmm. and anything mm-hmm. that would go on, w- were there any reconsiderations uh, that? Yeah, there was a number of textbooks, you know, it was sponsored by the Open Society, you know, there was a number of history textbooks with which were, you know, they claimed they were just translated from English, you know, so that, and that's what uh, caused Putin's uh, reaction, you know, because basically what those textbooks said was uh, very different from the uh, you know, the attempt of the government to revive this um, uh, memory, not just of World War II. People do not think of World War II as a glorious event, obviously. You know, they talk about it as a horrible war, destructive war, bloody war. What is being glorified is the victory, so, which is very different. It's not the war uh, which is glorified. It's the victory in the war. But, uh, you know, otherwise, you know, I read there were several articles, you know, quite a bit of research done on history textbooks and perceptions of these high seniors, you know, high school students of uh, Soviet history. And it is shocking f- to me, you know, to see how vague is the idea now of what was happening in uh, the 30s, in the 40s, in the 50s, in the 60s. I mean, it just seems it could be 18th century for them. You know, that's how kids, you know, kids who are now in high schools, so you say 17, so those who were born in 1990, you know, there's very little, uh, not just interest, but there is very little sensitivity about the history. And of course, where, where would they take it from? I mean, if you go to Moscow, well, you know, go anywhere in Russia, you know, it's a, it's a different, uh, the shell is very different. So, uh, you know, as I um, you know, identify the, or the attempt uh, that which is deliberately made uh, by the government is to glorify the victory as a unifying, uh, that inaugural uh, kind of a memory event, you know, for all the Russians. But I, I can't see any other event that they would uh, go into with such uh, dedication. But you're not aware whether they would uh, Well, you know, what I recommend, my students ask me this question, and particularly those who, even those who don't speak Russian, what I do, I print out the contents pages, you know, if you go to Journal Nezal, you know, and uh, print out the contents of uh, the uh, Tolstoy Journal, of those uh, historical and uh, political journals, and see the articles. I mean, it's extraordinary. The intensity of intellectual debate, you know, academic debate is extraordinary. You know, people can publish whatever they want to publish. You know, I'm not talking about TV, that's a different story. But if you go into Journal Nezal and you check the contents of the last, even if you can start from Putin, I'm not even talking about the 90s, but even in the early 90s, I remember being in Moscow when, uh, you know, you know, it was surreal, the dis- level of destruction, you know, the poverty, this uh, people digging garbage, you know, this, uh, you know, it was uh, terrible. And then you go into the Academy of Sciences and you see uh, the, uh, you know, agenda of the public seminars and they debate on the Uyghurs uh, Russia and uh, the classics and it was amazing how they preserved that uh, 
um, keen interest in this intellectual and academic development. So it's there, and I really recommend those who have doubted that there are different TV is a very different story, media, newspapers is a different story, but if you're interested in understanding the discourse, academic discourse in uh, uh, social sciences, go uh, into the contents of those journals and you will be amazed by the sophistication and the intensity of the debate. And just go to Palitru, I mean, look at the lectures there. Maybe one more small question. The small. <laughs> Mm. at least compared to 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And you've probably heard this theory uh, that you know, during the Cold War, or when the relations with Russia are really bad, students mm -hmm. take Russian language mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And whether this is sort of kind mm -hmm. of a gray area, mm -hmm. they lose interest. What really puzzles me is that despite all the negative changes you've talked about so eloquently, opportunities for, for young people Americans to work in Russia, to do research, to write dissertations, etc., to do business, are pretty enormous. So why, and again, maybe Middlebury is an exception, I'm impressed with the number of students here, and maybe it's a captive one here, but um, do you see this kind of, you know, students have much rather take Chinese or Arabic right now, and Russia is kind of like, like I said, it, it, where I teach, it, it's not really on the top of well, pragma I mean, there are two things. First, you know, again, I teach um, Monterey Institute of International Studies is a graduate school, and uh, we have students who come with Russian language, and they have great jobs. I mean, they have, get great jobs, either foreign service or treasury or business or consulting, and they're very happy. The issue is really the media here in the United States. As I said, I began with that, portrays the country which does not Islam some kind of a Putin land. You know, Putin land. There's only President Putin living there. You know, it's, uh, uh, that's, the, you know, what's projected. And, you know, young Americans, um, you know, many, uh, you know, from my experience at least, up, uh, you know, have 21-year-old and 18-year-old, you know, they are quite pragmatic. I remember I took my son who was born in Russia and spent first five years in Russia to the library. He was about eight or nine. He's graduating from Carleton College this year. And uh, I saw the uh, Uncle Tom's cabin, you know, when we were growing up, it was one of our favorite, you know, really favorite book. You know all, right? About. And I said, Boris, look, this is such a wonderful book. You haven't read it. You must read it. I said, you know, it's so wonderful. I was crying and crying when I read it. And he looked at me, and here is the Russian child, 100% Russian, 50% 50 Russian, 50% Jewish genes. And he says, Mother, why would you recommend me a book uh, which makes you cry? You know, so it's a completely different, uh, uh, you know, perception of things. And, you know, at that age he was nine. Now he's into Dostoevsky, you know, but he had to live until 21 to get into Dostoevsky. So, uh, you know, the, the short answer to your question, I think, uh, you know, the young population here falls victims to the propaganda. I call what's happening now in terms of interpretation of what's happening in Russia as, uh, you know, because it's done through such ideological lens that uh, young people have no opportunity to be exposed in any way to the wealth of Russian culture that's still there or to the wealth of opportunities. That's pragmatism, jobs, jobs, and literature. You know, when I started to teach uh, 18 years ago, my students were coming because they read Crime and Punishment, or they read Brothers Karamazov. That's how they got interested in Russia. Uh, you know, now I have students who lived and worked in Russia, and they are really set to make a difference in U.S.-Russian relations. So it's a very different generation. But in order for the young Americans to get to the stage when they want to make a difference, when they want these two countries to come closer, we need some exposure for them. And it's not happening. Exposure of the things that are classical Russian things, you know, that uh, makes up this you know, gold, the, the treasure of Russian civilization. And that's up to us, to the faculty, I guess, and to the writers. And, uh, you know, we can do what we can do in order to make it a very attractive country, not just from the point of view of pragmatism, but from the point of view of human interest. Alrighty, I think uh, we'll wrap it okay. up there. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.